and we're in and we're live. How are you doing today? Not too bad. How about you? So you've come in from London. I have indeed. <laughs> How was that? So far, so good. Yeah. Uh, you know, first time in America in about almost 10 years. Been eight years. 10 years. Since I've been in America and LA, to be honest. Um, and it's just good to be back. Feels refreshing. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, no, LA's uh, LA's nice, especially if you've been in in London in the UK, like yeah. through the winter. This is like a, a nice reawakening into sunlight. Sunlight. Yeah, we've had six months of rain and cold. You know, five degrees Celsius weather for you know it's been miserable. So having a bit of the sun has just been amazing. Yeah, people in LA get all like upset because um, it rained for like a couple of days here in the winter, and people lose their minds. But when you think about the weather in Paris and London and Berlin or yeah. Zurich, it's uh, nice. Paris is, is still a bit better. Uh, obviously, I'm from Paris, so I'll I'll vouch for my home city. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no. Listen, glad to be here. So, how did you go from Paris to London to LA? What is your story, man? Oh, uh, I mean, how far back do you want to go? You were born in Paris. We can start there. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, so yeah, born born and raised in Paris to French dad, English mom. Uh -huh. Uh, so already from the get go, started growing up very multiculturally in a way, uh, even though. You know, probably not as diverse as, say, having an, an Asian parent and a, a European father or whatever, you know what I mean? But uh, still, you know, grew up um, in Paris, went to, started in French system, yeah, just didn't work out. And I moved to the American school in Paris um, and just found my suit there because, you know, it's very... It was a lot more open to creativity than the French system. French system is very sort of... Um, rigid does that does that stereotype really play out like it, it does you know the the french system is known for math politics and science which is why some of the greatest schools are polytechnic mm. uh sciences po and uh, insead for business um and so you know the french aren't so open to to the creative uh, spectrum it, surprisingly obviously because you've got a huge industry in france uh, uh, which has been going on forever. Yeah. The, the arts in France are a huge deal. I, it's, it's strange that they're not more it is, but promoted. Not, well, that's the thing. I feel it's a very sort of independent sector to the rest of the French society, French mentality of education. Um, I think you it's almost perceived as a nomad career, if you see what I mean. Uh, because going Going against your family's wishes. Pretty much. I, I think that that's very much it because, um, you know, when you go to school, all they'll teach you is math, French and history and science. And that's about it. There's no you've got sports as an extracurriculum. It's not part of the school system. Mm -hmm. And so is anything else you do. There's no, you know, obviously, when I went to the American school, you had spec classes, whether you wanted to be in theater, you wanted to do computer science, you wanted to do uh you, you wanted to do anything really ceramics if <laughs> yeah. and so that's why so quickly at the end of my primary years of, of the french system i sort of quickly moved out of that that's interesting so what i mean what was it like being a young person like living in paris surrounded by all that history and architecture and worldly kind of existence because like i've been to paris many times yeah. and i mean obviously as a tourist it's different than living there and that's that's what i'm trying to get at i think is like you know, we all go to Paris for a weekend or a week and we visit the museums and we walk along the Champs-Élysées yeah. and it's gorgeous and you're filled with, you know, excitement. But what's it like actually living there? I think it's it's a really exciting city. I know that it can be tough for a lot of foreigners coming in because the French can feel a bit closed in and very strict towards foreigners you know and the and the parisians are their own beast oh, like the, they're they were they're the toughest of the tough you definitely cannot compare parisians to the rest of france you yeah. know the the french are very kind people but the parisians have a bit of an elitist mentality and i think that just plays into them being very stubborn and on peu just a little a little bit <laughs> just. but i think the beauty of paris mm. is how culturally diverse of a hub it is you know between fashion week which brings the world from all corners of the globe to to paris it brings a sense of color and culture and 
Um, and then on top of that, you do, you know, when you are part of the French circle, the Parisian circle, it is a very social city. We, you know, people meet up at cafes all the time, spend all day sitting at the cafe, having a, a little coffee, uh, people watch, talk all day, and the French will let you stay on that terrace for as long as you want. It's not like in America where after two hours they kick you out. Two hours, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I, lo I love that, though, because like, like someone was explaining this to me. I was So I was last in Paris. I was watching um, the Rugby World Cup. Right. So I was there in September 2023. Um, I went with some friends. We watched Australia versus Georgia. It was one of the early qualifying matches. I love rugby. So um, Fair enough. yeah. And uh, being at the Stade de France, you know, eighty-five thousand crazy Australians. In it's, Georgia, it's 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 world class. Yeah. But um, but someone was saying to me, like um, like in Paris and and France in general, like people, you know, pe people uh, work to live. They don't live to work, right? So they like to, you know, they they actually enjoy strolling through museums and sitting on terraces for hours and having conversation. And I feel like there's there's this much more like really enjoying life yeah and spending time enjoying life versus just trying to make as much money and then trying to enjoy life as quickly as possible for as short a time as possible it's funny you say that because actually i i seem to see the opposite i see you know the french are a very traditionalist uh culture yeah. you know we they grew up through the war which was really tough on on the french uh whole you know mental health and physical health and a lot of those traditional sort of military values sort of play into at least our parents generation uh where work was you you just had to work Big, people were workaholics in france and i think it it made france a, a, a great place to for development and business and uh and and all of that but it also definitely closed uh, it, it created a bit of a closed-minded mentality in France, and I think it's more so the younger generation, uh, so mine and probably that between my parents and I, who've sort of adopted a new mentality to be a bit more free, a little, you know, traveling for, out of France is, is very much a recent thing. You know, people, my father didn't travel until he was in his 20s. Oh, that's uh, interesting because you're so connected to the rest of Europe. Well, that's the thing. But the French were not known for travel. And it's only towards, I'd say, the 70s when the French started becoming a bit more uh, interested in, in Asia, and uh, which is why you see so much of the French market moving you know, in Asia and Japan and China. Uh, and you see so many businessmen moving you know to to those countries yeah. especially with the luxury good boom right exactly like, like i lived in shanghai china for mm. like 18 years and you know slowly slowly like you get the the whole lvmh group just started setting up shops right next to each other on on nanjing shilu which is like the main mm. high street in in shanghai so yeah exactly. you, you saw it and then of course all the executives came with it right exactly yeah. and so um but still you know i think paris is is becoming younger it's becoming more open becoming more culturally diverse um with more and more americans and uh and asians moving to paris getting the parisian experience mm -hmm. and uh yeah it's just made growing up in paris very interesting um and obviously going to an american school which was a very international system with people from all around the globe expats uh and you know, we had people from Mozambique, we had people from India, from Japan, mm. uh, from South America who had come. And so it just created that much more of a cultural hub for me growing up. Uh, and that would so have been wild having like classmates from all over the world oh, yeah. in, in Paris. Like it, not having to go to school in Kathmandu, but having everyone from all over the world just I kind think of... the school ended up on one of the years having something like 95 different nationalities, which was just... In, you would never see that in the French system, or or any system. Or any, I, I think that's pretty rare. Maybe in London you might get that. You you do. I mean, I think it's especially when you are in international systems that are so interlinked with like the American system, the British system, or or abroad. Um, but yeah, so obviously did that for a couple of years. Went to the American School of Paris, um, and then moved to London for my last two years of studies. 
and then soon after that went back to Paris uh, to study film for about three years. What was it, what was that like? What years were these? Like when when did you go back to Paris to study film? Uh, twenty. 17 is when I graduated. Oh my God, you're so young. I didn't figure that out until now. I, uh, I'm a 98. And wow, 98, okay. So there you go. Yeah. Um, and then studied film for three years. And the day I graduated, it was a school called ACAR. Um, that's as much as I'm going to say. <laughs> was it, is, it, is it kind of like known for film and television studies? or is The it... only international film school in France. And the thing is, when I was applying, I was trying to apply to American schools above all. Like, of... like NYU and Southern? No, I was Southern West Cal- Coast kind of guy. So yeah. uh, USC, UCLA, Chapman. Mm. Um, I did get into University of Miami, but it just didn't really speak to me. And um, not unless you just want to party all the time. Exactly, but uh, it, the the thing is, in the end, I picked Paris just because it was closer to home, and because I didn't get into the Western schools, it's just like I'm, I'd rather if I'm going to go that far, I'd rather go to where I want to, and if I can't, I'd rather stay closer to home, stay close to friends, family, and all that. Um, which in the end turned out to be a, a good decision, and we'll get to that eventually. But um, what well, was so so you're growing up in Paris, like yeah. Like, I mean, what, I mean, what were your interests as a young person living in Paris? I mean, were you playing football as a kid or soccer? Like, I did uh, play sports. Uh, obviously, football is is my number one sort of big passion. Uh, so obviously, I played it a lot at school, hmm. and even when I was in the French system, I did it. Uh, I did take part in some teams around uh, the neighborhood, um, but. Sports and I also played golf, but I'd say it was just it, I wasn't like passionate to the point of I want to become a football player, you know. Uh, if I probably else, saved you, exactly. Yeah. If anything, I was more like if I'm going to go into football, I'd rather do coaching or be more on the sort of sport directing side. And um, but obviously, I think for me, what was the biggest interest for me was photography. The camera, I got to hold that up. Yeah. No. Oh, there you go. <laughs> nice. So that's a. So hold on. <laughs> yeah. Now what do we got here? We got a. And this is beautiful. This is a film camera. Yeah. Thirty-five mil. Uh, right. I've started beautiful. doing thirty-five mil for the last uh, three, four years. But yeah. you know, when I started out, obviously it was just uh, it, it was a lot of you know your little cameras with the focus, single focal. And I did that a lot uh, when I was traveling. I had a GoPro and I would do f- travel videos with my, you know, whenever we went somewhere with the family. And uh, obviously as a kid, you know, you had the little sort of stick, you know, those little video cams and you would do stick figure uh, animations. And so I, I think that that was a huge interest for me. But then um, I actually, funny enough, had more of an interest in architecture about the age of 11. Oh, that's interesting. And that's a neat twist. It is, and my dad, who was very old-fashioned, uh, sent me to my first internship at 11. He was just like, when I hit 11, and he, he was like, you know what you want to do? I'm going to send you to to your first internship. You at 11? At 11, and... I think I, I was still playing with G.I. Joe and, like, Transformers <laughs> at 11. Well, it was only about a week or two internship, but to be honest, it was it was really fascinating because it was like, I, I really am interested in architecture. It was it was a passion at the time, and I would draw a lot. Mm. Um, and so it was interesting to see the nooks and crannies of, of that sort of field. Uh, at 11, though. I mean, could you even appreciate it? You know what? I didn't mind it. You know, if you'd asked me to go and, you know, work in a, in a finance office, I'd probably go, oh, my God, this is this is a bit intense. But these guys, you know, these are guys who are having, you know, very calm meetings. They're just talking about the, the buildings and you go to the building sites and it's just like, oh, wow, this is, you know. Um, when you think about it, though, like architecture and filmmaking... And well, I mean, we're going to get into your cinematography yeah. work and your and your filmmaking as as well. But like when you think about it, architecture has something a little similar to like filmmaking because yeah. like you know you you design an idea, you write a script, you know you you have a space or a plot, you know you 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 location scout, well, and I then th- you get to and then you get to see the finished product. Mm-hmm. Like that's the payoff, right? Well, I think what also helped a lot is and where I see the parallel is more so there's you know film or photography is all about composition and lighting Mm. and architecture is about the same it's geometry and lighting you know you 
trying to create spaces that are interesting to people, which also produce, you know, nice lighting because that helps sort of bring out the interior. Um, and I think, and then obviously the drawing, it's a lot of conceptualizing, which is similar to doing storyboarding or, uh, or you know, so it was... Uh, the, the transition was sort of natural, but I did internships every year between then and uh, and when I hit 15 uh, in architecture studios. Oh, so this was a, this was a repeat offense. Oh, big time. <laughs> and uh, so 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah. And then when I hit 15, um, that's when I sort of realized the math was just not there. <laughs> and I was like, I have to have a bit of a reality check and go, I love architecture, but this isn't going to work. It's pretty, it's pretty math heavy. It's pretty math heavy. And I was never a, a, a math head. I just didn't like it, didn't understand it. Um, and so it was actually uh, a, a good uh, friend of ours, a uh, family friend, who saw some of my travel videos and, and she's like, you know, you're not too bad at this. Have you ever considered film? And I'm like, film? No, I mean, let me let me look into it. Uh, I'd seen films. I, I was grow I grew up watching films, uh, but I'd never actually thought of the whole process of making a film. And so I thought I'd throw myself into a summer course. So I did uh, USC's Warner Bros. course for six weeks. What's that? Uh, it's a summer course that they do, which uh, is really an introduction to film. Uh, and then at the end, they they allow you to shoot a, a sort of your thesis with a team uh, in the back lots of Warner Bros. So that was just the cool sort of quirk. That's that's pretty epic. So you got to so it's a six week like crash course at University yeah. of Southern Cal with Warner Brothers. Yeah, which you learn everything from the writing to the directing, producing, editing, and cinematography. And I think for me, that how old were you? That's an amazing I experience. About Fifteen or sixteen? That was in twenty fifteen that it took place. So yeah, sixteen. No, oh, actually, it was when I was about to turn sixteen. Um, that must have just set your creative light. Oh, like, that on was fire. that was like a light bulb moment. It's like because especially the cinematography just hit me right there and then. Mm -hmm. You know, when I picked up the camera to shoot the first project, I was like, my God, this is like my photography all again. And I was just like, this is really cool. And having to find shots and seeing the action playing out in front of camera and you know being able to light and be sort of experiment um was quite fun and uh and then obviously i moved uh straight after the course i got my first job on set on tell me how i die which was a, a one of those b movies shot at la center studios because uh, one of the girls on the course, her dad is was uh, working there, and that's how this town works. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, our family friend, who actually was the one who uh, recommended that I go into film, her son uh, Jack Heston uh, was is a producer and was starting out in producing back then, and he was one of the co-producers on this. So he's like, oh well, small world. Like, let's bring you on, and I PA'd. And it was the worst experience of my life. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, they made me scrub toilets and um, and then the whole crew were just complaining like, oh, this, this set, it's like, it, um, I, words I can't probably say <laughs> on here, but uh, it was just like, I was like, oh my God, is this what film is? Not so, not so, so glamorous. Not so glamorous. I was like, is this really what I want to do? And then I was fortunate enough through again meeting someone to get onto the set the following year of uh star wars the last jedi in pinewood studios for that small years. small little movie pinewood just exactly. north of london right exactly yeah. uh you know small experience you know one of those but no it was that was that was life-changing mm -hmm. uh i think when you see the other scale the other side of the scale and when you see those kind of sets, the the way they work, and you see the, you know, the top crews at their their peak, that's where you go. Now that's where I want to be. That Pinewoods, that, Pinewoods, amazing too. Oh, it's amazing. Hmm. Uh, and I think the I can literally tell you the moment uh, that I just knew I wanted to be in film, and it was uh, me admitting something uh, on on here, which I don't think. Uh, the person who brought me on knew, because uh, I was PA on the AD team. 
Mm-hmm. And there was one scene in the film where uh, John Boyega, and I forget the name of the, the Asian girl who plays in, in the film, they steal a spaceship and then crash it into the cave uh, where the rebels are just before the fight on the Salt Lake. Um, Isn't it Daisy 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 no, Ridley? Ridley was the the main actress, but right. there was a, a, a I don't remember her name the the Asian girl who who's who's sort of like like this with John Boyega throughout the film, and John Boyega was a stormtrooper that that uh, exactly. escaped or 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 yeah ditched his stormtrooper life for exactly. for the rebels I think yeah yeah that, I saw that. And uh, so they built an, in the 007 soundstage the whole cave, and they built a life-size spaceship on train tracks. Um, and already walking into that, you're just like, "This is, this is insane." Um, and then they shot eight cameras, one take, four Ari Flex film cameras, four digital Ari Minis uh, LF, and I was being asked to go outside the soundstage to manage traffic. But I just knew this is like this was like the biggest moment of my life, and so I hid in the corner of the soundstage instead of going outside. And you know, you, you had the first lady going in, cameras rolling, sound rolling, and three, two, one, action, and just the whole spaceship crashing through the set, explosions everywhere, and it was just sort of like watching the, just the stars popped in my eyes and I was like wow now that is filmmaking and that's what I want to be part of and at, the, at the highest level at the highest level mm-hmm. but that was that was when I knew I just needed to be in this industry mm-hmm. um, and uh, and then yeah I mean obviously I did lots of work experience in between then and and now and during schooling uh, film school and all that but uh what was it like? What was it like, kind of growing up in Paris and going to film school? Like when you went, when you came back from London. I mean, where did you have a chance to do internships there? Like, did you like? Is French filmmaking a a big thing? Like, I know there's movies that come out of France, obviously, but I don't. I it's not. It's not. I've never been huge. I left Paris for the oh, sole reason that I'm not a, a big fan of the French film industry. I think there's a lot of flaws in it. You know, it's a very stubborn industry, which lacks ambition that some countries now have like England you know Korea is a growing industry uh, on the international stage and you sort of go well how come France are capable of doing what Korea are doing when we you know the French were the ones who invented cinema and then the Americans appropriated it and created Hollywood and surpassed the French you know exponentially and then the americans just keep going back to paris and france and exactly. make beautiful movies exactly yeah and you sort of just go uh, uh, you know how is how are the french doing films like hollywood are and i think it comes down to a, a little bit of you know pinching their their pockets you know mm-hmm. because they they'd rather make Five low budget films which are recycled comedies and and dramas that sell in cinema uh, then go and make Napoleon instead of Ridley Scott you know you sort of go how is a French story like Napoleon not made by the French and it's because they do not want to spend huge amounts of money to compete on the international stage which is which is strange because they, you know again from where they've come from in the film industry at the you know they were there in the early early stages exactly and so I think that just that lack of ambition just sort of got me very uninterested in the French film industry and why I moved to London also as an aside I think language has a huge issue because I just think like it, it, obviously English is the major m- motion picture yeah. language around the world right I mean obviously. Um, English movies carry further than any other yeah. language or movie. So, I mean, you're, right away there, you're guaranteeing eyeballs, you're guaranteeing ticket sales. I mean, I can't, I lived in Shanghai for 18 years. I don't think I ever even saw a French Fair. film uh, in the theaters there. But of course, all, all the Marvel movies were there, all the Transformer movies were there, yeah. you know, uh, the Mission Impossible, whatever. Well, I think what's interesting is you know the world has become a lot more accepting of international cinema you know it's why korean cinema has been so booming so much 
uh, in the last five years um, and people don't mind reading subtitles just because the stories are interesting. And, you know, the French have huge amounts of popular actors. You know, Lupin is a great example of the French actually, well, actually, an American production putting money into a French series and it booming on the international stage. Yeah, this um, is the Lupin, the, the Netflix series. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, with Omar Sy, which, you know, I think a lot of Americans have heard of, probably watched. I know in the UK, it's very, it was very, very popular. Um, and you sort of go, well, why aren't the French, why, if it worked so well, why don't the French keep doing that? And it really comes down to a, a director, will it make a movie, make money back on that film and reinvest it into five films, you know, so that he can just, it's constant cash flow. Who's that? Who's the? Um, I'm gonna kick myself for not knowing this name. Who's the uh, French director who makes those huge blockbuster um, action sci-fi oh, movies? Luc Besson. Yeah. But you see, Luc Besson. He he directed he, fulfillment. That was that was huge, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. No, it was. Um, but I think he'd have been like Villeneuve in America. His career would have gone even further, I reckon, because I think sticking to France sort of limited him where he, he made this film and the French didn't really care. And so they didn't, re he had to look abroad for investment. And it's just that one, but the French never really cared for him. And I think obviously he's had his fair share of controversies and, and hardships uh, in the industry. But in general, I don't think the French really pride themselves on Luc Besson as much as Americans do on Steven Spielberg or some of the, even the rising, uh, you know, directors or DPs or all of that. I heard a, I heard an interesting story just recently, obviously, because we're just finished with all the awards season. Um, and uh, Christopher Nolan won Best Director and Best Picture for uh, Oppenheimer, right? Yeah. And uh, he was giving a talk at, in London. Um, maybe it was for the British Film Awards. I'm not sure. Mm. Something around that. And uh, they were celebrating him as like a British filmmaker and things like that. But he was like, actually like, you know, growing up in the UK didn't help him at all. Um, and there was no funding for any of the stories he wanted to tell and basically had to go to America to, you know, to, to have his career take off. So while he is, I guess, British, um, you know, he didn't have like great things to say about yeah. the British film industry at that time. I guess now it's much more supportive. I think because of the investments that's come into the UK, you know, the American money just being infused into the um, British market, uh, making bigger projects and more ambitious work in the UK has been far more accessible. Uh, whereas obviously back then for someone like Christopher Nolan, the, the UK film industry was still growing. It wasn't where it is today uh, by any means. And so obviously... You know, we're able now to make stuff like Peaky Blinders or Guy Ritchie's latest The Gentleman. Oh, that was lovely. I watched that on the yeah. weekend, yeah. But you see it's proper production value, big budgets and all that, whereas back in the day, you would you, there are no series that you can think of. You know, what was popular in England, and it still is today, is stuff like EastEnders or Hollyoaks, which are very low-budget mm -hmm. uh, TV series that just go on for century, <laughs> centuries at this point. Yeah. Um, or The Office, remember, with Ricky Gervais. I mean, that was really, I mean, I think they only did one or two seasons, but it was super low budget, but it caught on like wildfire. It did, but, you know, it didn't, uh, I mean, I'm probably too young, but I I definitely don't see it having the impact that the American Office did. You know, the, the U.S. version was really caught on like wildfire it's because they did like eight seasons like that's the problem in america they kill it right no absolutely but that's what i mean i think there was that there was a the english was still trying to figure out uh how to you know get about and make their stamp on the world stage uh, and it's only now that the americans have stepped in and when you know you got interesting actors you got interesting filmmakers and you have a tax cut of now, today, 40%, <laughs> the Americans are like, and you speak our language. Yeah. So. And great locations. Great locations. Yeah. So an even greater motivation for Americans to sort of produce stuff in, in England. That is part of the reason why I moved there. Yeah. <laughs> so so, so when, you were, when you were going to film school in Paris, I mean, what were you thinking as like an as 18, 19-year-old film school student in Paris do you 
do, were you just thinking, okay, I'm going to go to film school in Paris and then I'm going to go back to London to work or I got to get to America somehow, or you're going to make a, you're going to make a home for yourself in French cinema? No, I already knew that the French cinema was not for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just, there were no projects or films that I'd seen in France outside of the much older films, uh, Louis de Finesse and all that stuff. Um, you know, in France, there was just nothing that inspired me. And I'd always look at British cinema or American cinema for, for my inspiration as a, as a young filmmaker or as a kid. And uh, so I already knew, like, as soon as I got out of school, I was either going to the UK or the US. Um, and, you know, when I was at film school and also just before film school, like I said, I was, I was working every summer, uh, even, you know, from the first set job I did every summer I worked and I did a lot of work in Italy. Oh, that's interesting. What was going on in Italy? The first film I did was a, an international production shooting in Venice called The Aspirin Papers um, with a French first-time director. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was starring Vanessa Redgrave and Jolie uh, Richardson and Jonathan Rhys Myers. And I was uh, be like behind-the-scenes operator as well as uh, assistant to director. Oh, that must have been a great experience. It, how how old were you? I was seventeen at the time, I think. That's amazing. Jonathan Reese Myers was huge around oh, then because he was, he did the, he did what match point with uh, he did. But he, I would he actually so Woody excited because growing up, one of my favorite action films was uh, um, from Paris with Love with John Travolta and Jonathan Reese Myers, and so and this was like for many years that was my go to action film. And so when I was told I was working with Jonathan Rhys Myers, it was like being starstruck. Mm. Um, and he's he's an interesting man, um, but uh, obviously it was it was just great. It, it just everything just felt like it was moving up. I then worked on an Italian film the following year, pure Italian production called uh, L'Agenzia di Bugiardi, which was uh, which I then moved into. ACing, I was a you know camera trainee, third AC, um, which was exciting, uh, an exciting step up, moving up the ladder. No more cleaning toilets, exactly. like like in California, big time. Yeah. Um, and then I that DP ended up bringing me the following year onto an advert in Tuscany called uh, for a company called Alcinero, uh, and that was even you know it was a small shoot. It was about a weekend, a long weekend, and that was really exciting as well. Following year, I then went to, well, this was in my first year of film school. I went to Rome and shot on, worked on a film called The Bunker, which was a French, French American production, I'd say, uh, collaborate, sorry, collaborating uh, with uh, an Italian production and a whole Italian team shooting in a bunker uh, just outside of, of Rome. And there I was again, I was moving up to like second AC now. And, and then when I went. A a AC being assistant camera operator. Correct. Yeah. Well, assistant, uh, camera assistant. Okay. So uh, I, at best I'm sort of moving tripods and cleaning the, the sort of camera carts and all that. But it was, it was exciting. You know, I was, I was getting closer and closer to the whole DPing and being, you know, closer to the action and uh, so every step just felt like uh, a more and more exciting development to, to the whole career, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, you're still a teenager at this stage, so that must oh, have yeah. been incredible. Uh, well, yeah, at that point I was like 18, 19, mm -hmm. so. Um, and then finished film school, moved to the UK, uh, and <laughs> uh, I admit this uh, in public now, but uh, obviously I sold myself as a focus puller when I moved there when I'd only focus pulled twice prior. So, you know, the famous saying, fake it till you make it. But it was just because I moved to the UK, I had zero contacts. I knew no one. It was just a clean slate. And, you know, especially my parents had no one in the in, weren't in the industry. They knew no one in the industry. And so this was just really me take, packing my bags and moving somewhere on my own, doing my own thing. And what were you just like in London, like go, going around to production companies, introducing yourself? I'd, I'd introduce them. I'd sent out like hundreds upon hundreds of emails to DPs because I, I, 
at the time I was like, that's the way to get to on their teams, you know, just email the DPs and they'll have a project and they'll bring you on. Yeah. Cause it's hard, right? Cause who do you even write to? Like, like, well, do you, you write to the production projects that you enjoy all of the films series that you like, and you just reach out to those DPs that you are, you know, you love their work and you sort of want to be around them when they're, uh, you know, working. Um, and that out of the, Three, four hundred emails I sent. I think I only had like 20, uh, 12 responses. Uh, one which got me in touch with another DP, and so there was there was a that. But I think what I ended up doing, which really paid off, was uh, I took a risk by not only selling myself as an eighth focus puller when I had little experience, but it was I knew that on most jobs it was easier to hire first ACs than second ACs because people could on low budget stuff could only afford a first AC uh and I did it a, a lot of these for free okay I did, yeah as I did as many gigs as possible for free to meet as many people as possible and uh, that's how the, that's how the industry works uh, just a, just a quick aside what's yeah. a focus puller I know what a focus puller is just for the audience yeah no uh obviously you know on in the cinematography department or director photography department you have three sub departments you've got camera lighting and grip grip being dollies cranes and all the mechanical stuff lighting self-explanatory i think and then in camera you have your camera operator unless you as a dp camera operate uh and then you would have your focus puller which is the person just keeping tab on focus usually they're also known as first ac so they don't ju just focus they'll also deal with the settings on the camera and changing the lenses uh but that's their task and then yeah. second acs will move the equipments and help change the lens for the first with the first ac and then obviously everything below that just you know you spread out the the sort of work and duties there's nothing better than a great pull focus right where we're just yeah. where you're on one thing and you just pull back and it's tough because sometimes you know if you're wide open you know a very sensitive focal uh and if you're even on a tight lens like a hundred mil lens yeah you can it, you can make it very tough for a first ac so the you know great ones just they've got instinct and especially they've got a good eye they they have probably the best eye on set because they have such attention to detail um because obviously on smaller screens you might not see the focus being off but then you expand that onto a cinema screen and the slightest mark uh you know hair off focus will be seen super clearly on a on a wide screen so there is a lot of pressure I uh I was listening to um I was listening to an interview a long time ago and it was um an old DP yeah. director of photography and he was saying like how how much trust the directors used to have in DPs back in the day before everything was digital and before the directors could sit in their little tent with five screens up and see all the cameras and all the frames and everything like that cuz cuz now the director can sit in their little camera tent or director tent and, and they can watch everything, and, it, and if it doesn't hit, they can see it right away, right? Oh, yeah. But back in the day, but when they, everyone was still shooting on film, you know, the director would look over at the DP and be like, did we get it? And the DP would be like, we got it. And then that was it. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, next scene. Oh, yeah, there's definitely a lot more trust involved back in the day. Yeah. Um, and now you got like 100 people watching the feed, you know, oh, yeah. versus just the camera. Versus just, oh, yeah, they're like, it, we got it that. Is now we're at a point where because you can connect so many screens to the camera, everyone wants a monitor and everyone wants to see the, the film being shot. So, you know, makeup are asking for a monitor and production design are asking for a monitor. Sound are asking for a monitor. Uh, producers want a separate monitor to the director's. It, it can be just like, oh my God, okay. Let those who really, like the director needs to see his, his screen, you know, DP needs to check that the camera and the, the, the technicalities are there. But then, you know, for example, makeup artists realistically can sort of see the makeup in person. You're just like, anyways, but um, I don't take any discredit for like, we love you, makeup. We love you, yeah. action design and sound and all that. But, you know, 
camera departments. <laughs> it can be a lot. It can be a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and so yeah, that's wild. I mean, coming out of university, having those kinds of experiences, especially in continental Europe, that must have just been wild. Like working in Italy, you know, coming from yeah. Paris as a student, getting to work on these productions, and then going to London and somehow kind of making your way. It's... You know, in France, I've only ever worked once in France so far. I was a I was an electrician uh, on a sort of YouTube video for a big YouTuber, and that was over a two day shoot. Um, but that that was all about it. I spent more time shooting in Italy than I did in France. Or yeah. well, how telling how telling is that of the French film industry? I mean, it's I I because it's true. Like I I just I mean I I watch a lot of cinema and uh, I love movies and yeah, it's it's hard to find something recent that's been yeah. really really good out of france well, i think also what makes it tough a bit like the whole parisian thing we mentioned about sort of being closed to foreigners and just being sort of their own bubble mm. the french film industry is even harder on anyone who hasn't gone through the french film education you know la famise and and all of those you know, if you're not part of that circle and if you haven't grown up in that circle, getting into the French film industry is n nigh on impossible. Really? You, you you feel that a little bit. Like, like so I was in Cannes. Um, I've been to Cannes a few times and uh, and the film festival there is obviously world class. So and, and there's a there's this huge dichotomy between like the international blockbusters yep. and then French cinema. And it's just like and all the time you see these, you know, these artists, directors, actors, um, you know, speaking in French, sitting around a table, and it, they're just like completely closed off, not interested in talking to anyone else. And then you see the Americans come in and they throw all the money at Cannes, right? Yeah. All the like Harrison Ford was there last year, you know, with Indiana Jones, which is like, why is he at Cannes? But he was there. And there's just this huge, loud media. But then you see all these, then all the French are just sitting around having coffee, talking about their projects and things like that. Totally different energy. Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah. Um, so another reason why I left yeah. for the UK. So. So, so I mean, you were working on some projects for free just to meet people. You were working your way up to like first, you know, assistant camera. You know, when did someone actually let you trust you to to to, to DP? To DP, yeah. Um, actually, it, it's all a bit of a wild story. Uh, so, firstly, obviously, I DP'd some shorts between school, but even out to school, there was one or two shorts I did when I got to London, and then I. I wrote, uh, at, produced, and DP'd a short of mine called The Take, uh, which was just, I'd always been inspired by James Bond, and I wanted to do something similar to it. And, uh, yeah, it was obviously so that. So you, you called up Daniel Craig. What did he say? He he, he said maybe on, on season two, but no. <laughs> but, uh, no, actually, so obviously I didn't want to direct because that was too many hats to, to put on. Hmm. And so I brought a, a, a guy that I'd met uh, through my ACing in London who had brought me on a few projects following that because we sort of clicked uh, called uh, Joshua Gwynn. And he, so I brought him on to, to direct. And so we co-wrote the, the short and we co-wrote uh, and he directed uh, the short for the two days in, in France and one day in Bolton. Um, and... By pure coincidence, he was first ADing a the London part of the sh uh, the shoot for this this director producer called Philippe Martinez, who has a production company called MSR, and they were shooting the end of a film and then the start to another film uh, in this one week in London, and in about three days the director had gone through three DPs. Oh really? He was just turning them out. And... Oh yeah. I mean, the first one had hurt her hang her ankle, so I had to drop out. Second guy uh, had a, a young kid was moving homes and just couldn't make it uh, for the rest of the shoot. And uh, then the third one had a big falling out with the director and just got chopped off. <laughs> and uh, and then on a Wednesday night, because they were shooting not far from where I live, Josh goes, "Hey." Uh, you know, I we've been talking about the film, and he was he was telling me all the gossip. I was like, "Oh my god, this is kind of mental." Um, and he's like, "We're shooting. The, we need someone for the next two days. What are you up to?" I go, "Oh well, nothing." He's like, "Well, 
come on, come on, and like we need a camera operator. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So who's the DOP? And he goes, you are. Oh my god! Was like, wow. Oh wait, right. Oh, uh, and this, and I'd been made aware that this was a movie with Elizabeth Hurley, and I'm like, this is this is pretty big. And I said, does the director know that Mike's my CV goes as far as six short films as a DP? And I've never done a feature before. And he goes, don't worry about it. He's French. You're French. You'll get along just fine. I think I think that's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> I was well when you're in surrounded by Scouse crew yeah. uh, and uh, with really strong accents from all around England. As a French uh, guy, he he just had had enough. He was just like, speak English. Like he he just thought they were speaking gibberish, and so he just got really frustrated. And I think having a French person come on was like a breath of fresh air. And he came out the car. I arrived the next morning in front of Elizabeth Hurley's house. And he gets out the car and he doesn't say hi. He just walks up to me, grabs my hand and he goes, let's see how you do the next two days and then we'll talk. And I was like, fair, fair game. Like, yeah, that's amazing. Game, oh, let's yeah. do this. And um, told my crew, like, listen, you guys, they, they all looked like they were at the end of their lives. They were like, this has been the roughest three days we've had ever. And like, you know, so I said, guys, don't worry. I'm here to work with you. Just keep doing what you you've been doing for three days. Uh, you know, let's not mess with this. And uh, so this was a start to I'd, I'd been told it was a Netflix thing, which ended up not being Netflix. It was a Lionsgate feature. Um because it was the sequel to a film he'd released on Netflix called Father Christmas is Back with Kelsey Grammer and Elizabeth Hurley. Oh, um, I think. And so they were shooting the sequel, but Lionsgate had bought it, so they had to change the name to Christmas in Paradise. Uh, and so anyways, they, I was shooting those two days, and I thought I was just doing the two days. That's I really just thought I was covering for whoever was meant to, <laughs> to be doing that week. And uh, at the end of the two days... He, Philippe looks at me and he goes, great job. So we're shooting the rest of the film in the Caribbean in three weeks. Do you want to do it? And I was just like, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's your Christmas in paradise. I was mind blown. I was like, I don't know if he's aware of my experience, my age. Because uh, I was 23 at the time. And so, and I'm, I'm being told it's like a $4 million budget film with Kelsey Grammer, Elizabeth Hurley, and Billy Ray Cyrus. And I'm like, this is a bit this must be a prank and I was like okay but the only condition I've got is I bring my own gaffer and so he sort of looks to his his line producer sitting next to him and he sort of goes what's our situation with the gaffer and he goes oh we got Mike he he's shooting the short for Damien Hurley and he's meant to jump on as the gaffer um head electrician just for it and um and he goes tell him he'll be best boy you got your gaffer and I was just like yes small win <laughs> And then you went to the Caribbean to shoot for three weeks on a feature a week, film. Plus a, a week prep, so five weeks total. Um, and yeah, that was my first ever feature film, and that just sort of opened a couple doors, I mean, to say the least. It's amazing how, like, when you get your first chance like that, how you go through that, like, imposter syndrome. Like, oh, my God, like, my resume is not good enough to have this opportunity. Oh, yeah. But actually, you're a fucking star, so you might as well just grab it and yeah. go. You know, it's really funny because obviously I'd done those two days and I, I'd felt the pressure. You know, Philippe Martinez is is someone who's done numerous films but has been known to be very tough and he, he's, he's an old-fashioned director. He doesn't necessarily collaborate creatively with DPs. He saw me as like a camera operator that tells the gaffer where to put his light. That was sort of... I wasn't a DP. <laughs> well, um... And, uh, you know, so you'd tell me, like, I want this shot. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'll give you this shot. <laughs> but... Uh, what is that like, though, where you have to kind of park your creative voice? Because I know, like, you've... Obviously, you've done some short films. Yeah. You've directed your short films. you shot your own short films. So you have an idea of what yeah. things should look like. You have an idea of what... You well, I think I respected his experience and being 23 and it being my first feature. I was, I was accepting of that hardship because uh it was just a learn it, it was learning you know above all it was just me learning the most out of the situation and you know these are guys who whether they're good films or bad films have made numerous numerous feature films with some of the biggest actors 
And so I was just saying to myself, well, this is my opportunity to not only show that I'm capable of doing this sort of film, mm -hmm. and I'll get into some <laughs> some funny stories, uh, but uh, you know, also, yeah, I I go into every film learning. You know, uh, I watched uh, there's a famous podcast back in the day called The Director's Chair, uh, where they would invite all these big filmmakers. And there was one episode with Francis Ford Coppola. I remember watching that as a sort of teenager. And Coppola, who I adore um, in, uh, uh, for directing, uh, said on that podcast, he's like, you know, I know what I've produced, I've directed and I've done The Godfather, I've done Apocalypse Now, but it doesn't stop me walking onto every next set with a student's mentality, I'm always ready to learn more. And I think that spoke to me because it was like, doesn't matter if you, you're an Oscar winning director, DP or whatever, you know, if you go in with an open mind and ready to learn something new, you, it will help you progress. And so that was just my whole mentality on that. It's such a healthy attitude because there's so much ego in this business. Oh, and, and I think yeah. that, uh, you know, if you can park your ego mm. and you just come in and like want to learn, like it just changes the way everyone works with yeah. you. It, it, yeah. And I think what's interesting as well is, you know, many people would have told me physically between at school, I was told I was never good enough and I would never amount to being a DP by my own cinematography teacher. That's nice to hear, isn't I it? No, absolutely. And I was before I got that feature film, I'd been proposed at my, another feature film, which was a low budget horror, which I never ended up doing. But when I accepted it at the time, I had people around me going like, "This is a really stupid idea. You shouldn't DP yet. You should go up the ladder. It's it's the way." And I I was like, "No, but I I I feel like I know what I'm doing, and I'm going to do it my way," you know. And uh, so obviously doing this feature at 23, the Lionsgate film, everyone was like, sure about this. But I think what was great is, and what helped me on that film, is I went into it, even in those two days in London, going, for all I care, I'll get fired, but at least I've done the, the experience. I've learned, and I've got a whole career ahead of me to rebuild from that, that failure. Um, and so even going to the Caribbean, I was like, I, I went into every day going, I'm, I'll accept being fired if I have, if that happens, but I'm going to give it my best. I'm going to give it 200% and I'm going to prove people wrong. And, you know, when I got to the island in St. Kitts, the crew who were there had already started placing bets onto how long I and my gaffer would, would last. That, that's got to feel nice. Oh yeah. I mean, it was, but you know what? I... Again, people would just take that as like uh, an insult and all that. I took that as fuel for, for to, to just go, well, another reason to prove you wrong. And it just being there, having been offered that role was already huge for me. I, I don't care if I'd done a day, or two days, a week, uh, or the whole film. The pride was that I had, someone had acknowledged that I was good enough to be offered that role. And that was huge for me. Mm. Um, how important, how important was like photography for you when growing up? Cause like, I know a lot of DPs, obviously I've made, I've made a lot of TV shows in my day too, and, uh, not feature films, but you know, having, um, having a DP who understands composition right from the get go is, is yeah. really helpful. And a lot of great DPs were photographers. Like, you know, were you interested in photography? You, I mean, this is why I've got this camera with me all everywhere I go and is why I, I did photography when I was young with the small sort of cameras. Um, I, and I, you know, I've taught two classes already to my IB film class from Tassis that I was part of back in the day and to my little brother's school where they have an, a film club. And so I gave two lectures to those, uh, to those schools and to all those young kids, I said, listen, your best tool as a filmmaker is photography because it allows you to analyze the world around you and helps you understand lighting, people, composition. And so I, I as a filmmaker, do not go anywhere without this because if I notice things that help develop my eye even further, which helps with uh, cinematography, you know, I, I, I do that. It's, it's an exercise. It keeps your brain and your eyes exercise when you're not shooting you know yeah no it's it's true it's uh 
It's really interesting. So I, I was a photographer. I was in China like for years with the New York Times and doing a lot of like photojournalism work yeah. and things like that. And and um, I didn't have any like formal training, but I, I really fell in love with just, you know, composing, making nice frames and, and yeah. trying to capture people in their natural environment, right? And I was always um, always fascinated by that. And then eventually I kind of gravitated to, you know, producing, directing and, and hosting, but my heart is still with the cameras, I no, think, I, in a lot of ways. I think photography was huge for me in terms of learning learning the camera trade early on. Uh, then I think one thing that helped as well is, you know, my father was in, in the fashion industry. So I was surrounded by that the world of uh, French fashion. And so, you know, color and the fashion shows, which were spectacles with lights and and movement and um, and then obviously lots of cultures coming together. And so a mix of the photography and the fashion really sort of helped me understand colors, understand light, understand people in composition so much deeper uh, from a young age. And so that's what I said, you know, earlier when I when I mentioned going to the Warner Bros program and they were teaching you to direct or this and that. And when it came to cinematography and I got a, a camera in my hands, I was like, oh, this is this is natural to me. This this makes sense to me. So we so we finally made your the the Paris connection though right with your father so that's nice like you know you grew up in and around fashion and I yeah. think that you know when you grow up around fashion when you see the lighting you see the designs and also you're there for, for the photography as well I mean yeah. it's 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 um, a unique experience I, for I a child to have not to do any photography in in that world of fashion I was way too young you know my my father worked in in fashion till about 2012 uh, before retiring. Uh, then he passed away in 2014. Uh, when I was, Sorry to hear about No, it's all right, you know. And it, so obviously I was 15 at the time. And that was literally just before I had chosen my path to, to cinema. Uh, but I think just the whole experience of seeing that world and being inspired by the colors that were used in fashion. And also, you know, my dad got me to be very involved in the community his meetings with much older people than i was at the time so i think from a very nat a young age i was always taught to to i actually have an easier time talking to older people than me than people my age and i think that's just because growing up i was told like oh you know i was introduced to older people who would ask about me and so i'd be talking to them and all that which helps me in film because it's all about communication oftentimes with uh, at least in my at my stage with people who are much older than I am. Well, especially when you're DPing your first feature film oh, at 23. Exactly. Everyone's older than you. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Philippe Martinez, who who is obviously much older than I am, uh, and, and the cast, I mean, Kelsey Grammer and, uh, is is a superstar in, in his domain. Mm. And so working with people like that was, was huge for me uh, and almost a bit daunting because <laughs> you... You know what they've seen, you know what they're capable of, and so you're trying to offer the best. But I think that's where I was, it was easy for me to open communication with them, with Kelsey, with Elizabeth, with Billy Ray, with Philippe Martinez, and um, express my vision or what up my work to them and make them feel comfortable uh, with what I was doing to help them. You know, at the end of the day, they are the ones who are giving us their, their best performance. You're making them look great. Exactly. How how much how so I've never been on a I've never been on a film set or or, or, or DP. Like how much interaction does a director of photography have with an actor, for example? Oh, huge. At the end of the day, I think a DP's trust relationship with with, with an actor is is huge because you know an actor entrusts you above anyone on set to make them look good to be able to produce their best performance because if you have horrible lighting and a bad camera angle and they're giving you an oscar worthy uh performance you, you you're sort of throwing them under the bus yeah you're getting their bad makeup and their double chin or something like that and it's, and it's over uh, no but exactly so they you know if they can trust you they will be able to work with you um you know it was it was interesting because I had very mi uh, different experience uh, on the Turkish feature I did, um, which we'll, we'll probably get to after yeah. this. But you know, the, the on on Christmas in Paradise, obviously 
the cast had years of experience. They they were at the top of their game and they had their own requirements. And so as a 23-year-old DP, I had to bend to them as much as possible. And they they were very sort of strict on me. And it was less so about working together than me having to work for them or with them. Um, whereas on the Turkish film, from Daydol, the two actors who are really huge in, in Turkey, Ozga and Me- uh, Mert, uh, they came up to me and said, listen, we're here to work with you whatever you need. And it just opened the dialogue to going like, I trust you, trust me, and let's let's just get the best out of both worlds. So back to the, the Christmas movie, uh, Holiday in Paradise, uh, Elizabeth Hurley, Kelsey Grammer. Like what kinds of demands would an actor make on a DP? Like what kind, like don't shoot me from the left or things like that? Or I mean, don't, angles, obviously don't, pre- for for. Someone like Elizabeth, they were, you, it was very important not to have any shadows on her face. Uh, that, that would seem important, though, for everyone. Yeah, but, you know, obviously there are situations or certain scenes where you should be able to allow a little bit more contrast or a little bit more mood. Because if, you, if you've got someone brightly lit, like a, on a sitcom, uh, in a scene which is very emotional, you know, where one's revealing their, their cancer to the other and the others bowling kind of doesn't really work the the juxtaposition is is a bit off you know people go i'm meant to feel really emotional and connected but it's lit in a way or in, and framed in a way that it's meant to feel very jovial and you're just like i'm not sure how i'm meant to feel yeah and it's, it's got to be like a little more dark and a little bit more moody well i it, yeah exactly i'm not saying that she has to have like a full shadowed side of her face but you know she you should be able to allow for a bit more a bit more of a natural look so that audiences and in that moment can connect to that character um instead of it looking like a, a photo shoot yeah that's always a big problem isn't it yeah and obviously th- there's lots of demands you know actors who who worked on films and have are picking stuff off each film going oh well i liked the way they did that i like the way they lit that and so sometimes they might go, well, I, I want you to use that technique, even though it's not your technique. It's not, it doesn't speak to you as a DP. You sort of have to, as a DP, you have to go, okay, well, let me see how I can fit this in to make them happy. How much, how much do you have to juggle between what the director wants and what the actors want? I think it, at the end of the day, the most important relationship is the director-actor relationship. Um, but uh, I think it all depends on how how that uh, the director's vision connects with the actor you know if the di- if the actor and director that connect is super connected whatever the actor asks for the director will probably agree with um if if a director asks something the actor will oftentimes go yeah if the director wants that sure uh on on situations where there are egos involved yeah you might it might be a bit tough to sort of go well l- you have to have to find a middle ground you know the director wants a wide shot but the the actress doesn't want to look that small so maybe instead of uh you you sort of have to find an angle that creates depth to make it feel wider and yet be on a tight enough lens that uh you know she's not a, a dot on the screen uh so you know it's all problem solving and at the end of the day dping above all and i say this uh and i've agreed on multiple occasions with dps i've met on this which is people you know looking to get into dping or young filmmakers with the aspiration of being dps think and like myself by the way back in the day i thought you know dping was all creativity it's all it's about the creative uh, lighting and just you all when you get to set all you do is sort of frame and light and that's your whole task but actually dping is 30 percent creativity and 70 percent or maybe 40 percent creativity and 60 percent politics yeah on set you're spending more time having to discuss and debate with the director the production designer the producer the actor and having to micromanage your teams you know the camera the lighting and the the grips um and so you know if that's where it's important to have crews that you trust you know p- people around you that are 
very experienced, know what they're doing, are capable of, you know, you, in pre-production, you've discussed your vision, you've discussed what you're looking for, and on set, they're capable of delivering without you having to check on them and going like, oh, how's the lighting coming along? Oh, I'm thinking of doing this. And like, actually, let's put a light there. Let's put a light there. Um, when it works well, it's beautiful how collaborative it can be. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think at the end of the day, trust and communication are key uh, as a DP. Uh, I always say to make a good film, you don't need money or you don't need talent. You need three things. Good communication, good preparation and good organization. Because I've seen I've been on many films where the budget's good. The actors are great. But the communication is so dreadful that it, the whole movie falls apart. And you actually see that on screen because because of the lack of communication between departments, things get screwed up, you know, whether it's the, in the camera side or the produ uh, the makeup side or this and that uh, or the production design. Like, oh, shit, you, we didn't know that we had to have a oh, sorry. No, no, <laughs> swear, swear as much as you like. Uh, no. Um, like oh, uh, we didn't know we had to have a a, a, a a a painting in the background here, or the curtains needed to be that color, and it's like oh, well, we have to now change change that if we've got a, a curtain that color, and it, you lose time and all that, and you know, obviously, time is money in film, so good communication, good preparation, good organization makes the whole sort of movie flow. Amazing, amazing. So after. Christmas in Paradise, your first shot with Lionsgate. What uh, what did you move on to next? Well, when I came back, obviously, I, I started just throwing myself out there as, uh, you know, this Lionsgate DP. and obviously No longer a focus puller. I'm a director of photography, baby. Exactly. And uh, people obviously got very interested in that. So I got called up on some music videos and some short films. Uh, and then at the end of that same year... Because uh, I shot Christmas in Paradise in like April of 2022. And then... Oh, wow. This was post-COVID. This was post-COVID, yes. Oh. And then in November of 2022, I had found uh, through So House on their sort of app, uh, someone had posted on the forum looking for an indie art house DOP uh, for this film in, in Turkey. And I sort of went, well... I'll, I mean, why not? Someone and, put that on a Soho house, like public posting. Oh yeah, and so I, I, it it was ridiculous, but it was quite like, oh my god, talk about timing. Yeah. And uh, so I got in touch. We connected, and within half an hour, he's like, yeah, you know, like let me put you in touch with the director, and he sent me the script, and I saw the pitch deck, and it just spoke to me because it was very sort of visual and naturalistic. Where um, where were you get to, where were we gonna get to shoot? Was it all in Istanbul? It, no, it was in the southeast of Turkey in a national park called Yumurtali. Uh and uh it was in a fishing village. Uh, which was really, really beautiful with the sunset sort of s setting on the water and all that stuff. And so southern Turkey is quite special for yeah. that. It's really pretty. It was an interesting part of the country. I mean, it's very rural. There is very little there. And so the director sort of, we got in touch and he sort of first messaged me going, oh, well, you know, I'm, I probably am going to go with a, a, a Turkish DP because it, it's just logistically makes more sense. And I sort of went, no, 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 no. <laughs> Give me five minutes of your time on a call and let me, let me see what I can convince you. Let me win you over. No, literally. And about 10 minutes into the call, he's like, love it. We seem to be on the same page. I'd love to work with you. So what? So hold on. You have um, you have a Zoom call, I guess, with a with a director in a different part of the country. Yep. I mean, what what does a director ask you, a director of photography, mm. in a ten or twenty minute call that would make him? He was very quick in saying like, "What's your experience?" What I've done one movie in the Caribbean. No, but I think that you know he the the thing is he was a a second time director. He'd only previously done one feature film, so. We were sort of on the same boat. Um, and obviously, I said to him, you know, this is this is what I'm capable of. Yeah, I'm young, but I, I delivered a Lionsgate feature film. And I'm I'm capable of doing this. And then again, he was then like, oh, what do you think of the script? So I sort of was like giving my notes on the script. 
and he's like well, we're thinking of shooting here what what's your thoughts on that and i was like honestly that's what sold the movie to me <laughs> it's like when they saw the pictures of location it was like sign me up and um and then also the fact that i said to, you know i explained my vision i said you know i'm i'm someone very naturalistic with lighting and i think uh this is this is exactly what the movie means you know it's it is very sort of documentary in, uh, influenced uh, and uh it, it's it needs to speak to the beauty of that part of the country and he that was sort of like listening to gold uh and he was like that's exactly what i'm looking for and so within three days signed a contract fourth day on a flight to istanbul was able to bring my gaffer on again <laughs> oh that's good yeah which is good yeah you get to keep and, him on team and uh and and then obviously the next day we checked kit flew to adana and about two days later we were shooting on set so all within one week i had found this project and got flown and started shooting this film uh which was an Turkish film, Turkish crew, Turkish cast, everything Turkish, but me and my gaffer. <laughs> and everyone thought I was crazy to go on to something like this. But I was like, you know, it's nothing new to me. I'm I'm used to cult, different cultures and I'm, I'm just, you know, if you communicate well, if you're able to communicate visions clearly uh, and, you know, even if it's through very basic English dialogue, um... You know, it goes a long way. And then for my gaffer, it was even easier because it's just very technical. When you say to someone, oh, I need an HMI, you know, an M40 here. It's all a quite in the lighting department. It's all pretty universal language. It's like saying I need a, uh, a, a an iPhone 13 there and an I, you know, a, a, a Toyota Prius here, you know, something very like generic. Um, I find it's for I, me. No. Oh, no, 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 it's just for me. It was just obviously a little more complicated because I'm having to discuss with so many departments, especially the first AD, who didn't speak a word of English. And so I'm just like, how long on time? I'm like, time, how long? <laughs> I, it's it's amazing to me that a director would go into production like in a week and not have a DOP. Well, they had one who dropped out for a bigger project film. Oh, that's interesting. And so that sort of why i think they didn't mind me because i accepted the low fee but i just knew that that was the kind of film that was going to help me with my work and you know he was very open from the beginning and giving me you know carte blanche for this film saying like you know we trust you pick your kit which uh w which was huge for me because on the lionsgate film i wasn't allowed to pick my equipment which camera did you choose uh i went for the sony venice uh, because, you know, we were shooting in, in a very natural uh, environment. Uh, we didn't have access to a huge amount of lighting. And uh, I needed, I, I was someone who was very naturalistic anyways, that I, I'm very much like single source, double source lighting max kind of thing, if I can, and just make the most of the natural light. And so I needed a camera that could perform in any situation. So when I knew that the Venice had that dual ISO, was had that sort of dynamic range, it was like, oh, this is, you know, this will help me uh, achieve what I'm looking for in any situation, whether we're shooting in a dark room at night with one single light and I could capture as much information as possible. And it's sort of the reason why now today I've moved to Sony Burano. I just got one the other day. Um, I'm moving from my red Komodo. And nice. I love Sony stuff. Like, we use them all the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's just, it's a, it's one of the only cameras that has all the tools you look for as a DP between the internal ND, which is even more accurate nowadays on the Sony, but you've got, you know, good slow motion, you've got good resolution, now you've got codecs that just are uh, super versatile and the usage of it is super easy. Uh, well, the menu's complicated, but the user buttons are make the whole camera that much easier to manipulate when you're shooting. Um, so we shot that Turkish film on, on Sony Venice. We'd cook classics. How long, how, how long were you on that shoot for? 
three weeks. We shot three weeks. We can do a whole feature film in just three weeks. Yep. Somehow. Uh, it was, it was tough. It was long days and just very efficient, uh, you know, a lot of efficiency. Um, but you know, we got it done and we just had, you know, the director was very trusting in, uh, in me and my gaffer, especially because the director actually ended up having his son, first son born at the end of the first week of shooting. His wife had gone into labor on the Friday, and so on the following two weeks, he had no sleep and would come to say, it's like, Chris, I trust you. Like, do the sh like do the shots. I trust you. Uh, and I was just like, okay, fair enough. You know, that's my, my call to go. Let me show you what I'm capable of. Mm. Um, and it was super refreshing um, because it just felt like, allowing an artist to express himself. You know? Yeah, that's the dream, right? Exactly. And you don't often, you really don't often get that opportunity. Oftentimes directors have their vision, they, they're they very strict and you have to work with them and you're, you're more of a support system uh, to, to directors. Um, whereas here it was just like, let let your creative juices flow. That's wild. So that was that was really fun for me. Uh, as well as being able to experiment with lighting and camera angles and all that stuff, and is easily my best piece of work today, um, visually. And so obviously that was that was great fun. Lots of you know, like every film, there's always shit going on on sets. You know, it's always it's not all smooth sailing, but it was um, you know I, the fact that I was able to do a Turkish film as a non-Turkish speaker with a full Turkish casting crew uh, was was an achievement in itself, I'd say. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, it's amazing because I think, you know, storytelling and film, television and production, it, it can take yeah. you all around the world. I no, mean, there's no, you don't have to stop anywhere. And yeah, I think it's it's what a lot of filmmakers aspire to, you know, to be able to travel and work and uh, travel as part of work. Um, and I'm very grateful that that's sort of what I've been given, you know? Mm. So, and, uh, and I mean, so, so let's go back a little bit. Sure. Um, so you kind of graduated from your film school in, 2020. Uh, right. So how was that? Like graduating film school in the middle of COVID? Well, obviously I think like any film student during that period uh it was really really tough because not only were a lot of classes uh cancelled you know i i unfortunately there was a really important workshop that they were doing in the last year for uh, which they did every year which is a film workshop learning to shoot and load negative uh you know celluloid and Today, in today's world, that's really, really important as a DP, knowing how to shoot and use celluloid film. And so they'd canceled that due to COVID because that was at the very start of the, the pandemic when they did a full lockdown and the school just didn't find the time to renew that workshop. So that was really a, a tough hit on me. And then... um. The, the obviously going into our thesis films we're being imposed a lot of uh restrictions on how to shoot where to shoot uh how how to we were learning a whole new way of filming because you're now being told on set you could only have so many people so you have to learn to sort of do shifts you know production design goes into set whilst the others are outside then they come out and then it's the camera team and then you know, so it was it was a whole new ex experiment, a whole new way of uh, learning to shoot. And it, it made it tough, for sure, because just the restrictions were like, oh, my God, you know, you want to do this, but you can't because you're too close to to one another or you uh, you can't be in, in too tight of a space because of COVID and and and, and all that. So it, it was interesting. I, uh, I have a friend here in LA who runs a production services company mm. and he was saying like at some stages of COVID during COVID when people were trying to shoot through COVID the COVID the COVID element of the production budget was sometimes 
an additional like 30 percent of okay. what of what it would take to actually make the movie yeah because then obviously you've got your you had at the time covid monitors like these guys who or girls would come in and just make sure that there was you know they'd done they were doing the tests on people coming into set and then uh even when they went off and came back the retest he said he said almost the entire budget was testing you know that's uh well one of the films i did you know the the bunker one in italy that was m- m- during covid as well and i just remember going to set every morning and it was just like if you know early in the morning something like 7 a.m and they're just shoving these long and especially the italians were not soft let's just be very clear about that the italians are aggressive <laughs> and they were just like you know they your you know your turn and they so shove it up your nose and they're like you know and you're just like oh my god first thing in the morning this really oh <laughs> and it's a terrible way to start the day oh yeah really horrible and uh so yeah the covid experience was was tough i think on many of us finishing film school because it uh, we lost out on a lot yeah but how amazing like because i mean in some ways you've learned how to make movies during the worst time ever to make movies oh yeah i mean that that goes on your cv you know <laughs> i was a covid filmmaker you know so i went through the covid training kind of thing i mean that by the way the whole covid training is genuinely on my cv i'm like you you cannot take away from you know did I ever tell you what happened to me during COVID? No. So I was filming in Ethiopia. I was up in the Simeon Mountains in northern Ethiopia. So, so what, like, when did COVID start kicking off? So in, like, December, you started hearing rumors out of China, right? And then in January, February, it was like, oh, now it's Italy. And then I was like, well, okay, I'm just going to go to Africa. Because, like, whatever <laughs> happens to the world, Africans are just going to keep waking up and going to work every day. Like, there's no... There's no shutting down an entire continent, right? Or so I thought. So I was like, I'm just going to go to Ethiopia and, sh- and find a great story and a yeah. guide and shoot. So I was, I went in March and I was just assuming that after Ethiopia, I would go some to Uganda or Kenya or just keep just filming in Africa. Because yeah. with my travel show, I could kind of film anywhere I wanted. Um, so it was good. But then uh, one day I kind of woke up, climbed up to the top of this ridge and checked my phone because we didn't have cell phone coverage for a day or two there. And, uh, yeah, when I got to the top of that ridge, it was like March, uh, 17th or 19th. And yeah, yeah, the whole world just closed. I know it was a bit frightening because, you know, the, the worst was that the day before the lockdown in France, we had just started the very first day of that film workshop, the cellular workshop. And so you sort of go, into the whole mindset and then the next day you're being told you can't come to school and it's just like wait what that's and that's crazy you know you're like oh well this must be temporary and no 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 if it's just going month after month and they're just like oh my god i i'm i wasn't ready for this like what what do i do you know all i all i know how to do is learn to do film at film school and you can't go out and shoot some some work for you for fun because you're not really allowed out <laughs> and so you're like well, what do I do? <laughs> so I, I barely got out of Ethiopia before they closed their borders. So we canceled filming for the first time yeah. in my whole life. We, we cut and run. Um, and so we had to, so we were up on this ridge uh, checking messages. And then we called a driver. Mm. And the nearest road was like eight hours away. So we like half ran to the nearest road. And then we got to the road. And then it took us like a day and a half to get back to Addis Ababa, which was the capital. And as we were going back to the capital, we didn't know where we were going to fly to because we didn't know what was going on. It's closed. Yeah. And because Africa had um, stayed open, other countries were stopping flights from the African continent into their countries Yeah, because they didn't like that the African continent stayed open and they were punishing people coming from Africa. So it was a nightmare. And I couldn't go back to Dubai, uh, which is where I was living at the time because... Um, they uh, they just stopped residents yeah. from coming back, which was very frustrating. So at one stage, sitting at the airport in Addis Ababa, I only had two options. I could fly to Canada because I was a Canadian passport holder, uh, which was like my, my last chance, or I could go to Istanbul, Turkey, and because Turkey stayed open for up until that stage. Um, and I was working on a big project in Saudi Arabia, and I wanted to kind of be in the same time zone because I thought like, okay, two weeks, one month, this will pass. 
and then I got to get back to work, right? Mm-hmm. So I was, so I, I was, I just flew to Istanbul, and then when I arrived in Istanbul, Turkey closed their borders. Um, same day, yeah, I arrived at seven a.m. Uh, and same day at five p.m. Yeah, Turkey closed so their borders. How long were you in Istanbul? Four months. Wow. Yeah, not working, not doing wow. anything. Wow. Yeah. It was it was surreal because because it's funny like um it's not funny it's kind of tragic but so I had two. I had two parts of my career. One was um, travel host and producer. Yeah. So we would be traveling the world, right? That's what we did. Um, so if you can't get on an airplane and you can't film in a city or up in the mountains or whatever, uh, then you're kind of out of work. Um, and then uh, and then the other thing I do is I do speaking. So I, I, used, I was in 2019, I did like more than 40 speaking events all around the world. And of course, you have to get on a plane. You have to sit in a room with a couple hundred people. Yeah, you know. So that was also gone. So I was literally sitting in Istanbul, doing nothing for four straight months because there was just nothing to do. So actually, I started, I started doing something called the COVID calls, where I would call up all my friends who were basically just sitting around doing nothing also, and I would do one hour Instagram live chats with them, just to keep myself going. Which ended up being an earlier version of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. No, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's how realistically a lot of podcasts sort of came about I, or popularized over the years, you know, through through COVID because people were like, well, all we can really do is chat. <laughs> so let's make like. the most of chatting, you know, let's let's record it and let's let people sort of hear into what's going on. Yeah, but there's no uh, plastic uh, gate between yeah. us here. Definitely not. <laughs> no screens, you know. Tip that one. But. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, okay, so you graduate film school in Paris yep. in what, like 2021? 2020. 2020, you graduated too. Yeah. My God. <laughs> so you went to London in 2020 in the middle of COVID looking for work. Yeah. In the film and television industry. Yeah. Which was completely destroyed and decimated. Absolutely. I was just that crazy at the time. I was just like, I need to get out of. Paris, I need to get out of French film industry, you know, wherever I go, I'll go. And but how hard was it to like knock on doors in the middle of COVID because no one was working? Well, I think um there were a lot of at the beginning at least, until the lockdown sort of ended, it was a lot of school thesis projects. So a lot of the projects I did starting out in the UK were on pro on short films for you know, Met Film School, the Guildford, all, all of that, who were doing their thesis. And I was just like, well, guess what? I just came out of film school. Uh, so I know what you guys are up to. I've done COVID training. That's fine. So, you know, you can trust me. I've got my own kit, you know, because I, what I did was I invested in a, in a wireless follow focus uh, to, to do the whole focusing thing. And so they were like, okay, just, you know what, we need someone, like, come on. Because also, you know, in, in film schools, getting crews is, is not as easy as it th- as you may think because there are many shorts that are happening at the same time because you're given a, a production period at school and everyone's fighting to have the best film students on their films. So you're having to fight different productions for crew and so sometimes you're left like, oh my God, all the focus pullers have been taken. All the DPs have been taken. So it's like, now we need to probably look outside of school to get people on. So that's just sort of what I tapped into. Oh, well, that's great. And at least you were staying busy. It, it definitely kept me busy. I think that first year I, I did something like 30, 30 different projects or 20, 20 to 30 different projects as a focus puller. It's amazing. So... Yeah. yeah, it was just a good way. You know, as I said, it was I, I had chosen to sacrifice a year of unpaid work. Well, there were some paid jobs. I mean, I did stuff for like Debenhams. I ended up shooting a commercial, uh, you know, like uh, focus pulling on a commercial and that all of that was paid. But a good majority were unpaid work because I was really just trying to meet as many people as I could and get a base network set up, you know. Yeah, it's not easy when you move to a new country. No, it definitely isn't. But, uh, and then obviously, you know, uh, the whole networking thing sort of transpired into what happened last year. Well, yeah, which was the strike. The strike. So obviously, you know, what was even tougher for me was 
obviously COVID had been a, a tough period for as, as a student filmmaker. Then I had finally moved to the UK, started building a network from nothing, then start DPing and in 2020 it was like this incredible year where all of a sudden I'm doing a Lionsgate film and another feature so two features in one year plus a few other projects 2023 comes and you're like okay well now I'm going to make the most of what 22 has given me and just sort of like push it even further in 2023 and you hit 2023 and the world goes we're going back we're shutting down again and yeah. you're just like oh my god it was like tripping as you'd only just started jogging you know it's soon because because of for those of you who aren't aware, we had the writer strike first here in Los Angeles, and then um, a few weeks or months later, we had an actor strike. Yeah, and actually that so that actually um, postponed my relocation to the U.S. because I was going to come to L.A. Um, in the summer and and re relocate yeah. here, but then with the actor strike, I ended up going back uh, to Switzerland and then eventually back to Dubai, and then yeah. and then waited and came back here in November once the strike was over. Yeah, and it was just, you know, the problem is the UK is so interlinked with the US uh, film market uh, because a lot of the money and production uh, influx from uh, for, uh, in the UK is from US production. That's why Netflix have based camp in, in the UK and so is HBO and so is Disney, or at least Lucas Films. And uh, so if the U.S. isn't working, the U.K. isn't working. I mean, last year, uh, in, what was it, in October or November of last year, Beck to the large union in the U.K., uh, had released a, a, a sort of article. They'd done a study and had uh, found out that 75% of the film industry in the U.K. was out of work. That's insane. 75% of that employment. That's millions of filmmakers. And um, and a third of those people ended up leaving the industry altogether. Yeah, because you, you have to take a job. You've got to do something. Exactly. And some have kids. You know, they've got families. And they just it's too much to wait a whole year without work. You know, some of the biggest rental companies like ProCam ended up going out of business when they were leading the, the rental department Um and so you see, you know, going into that year for me was just like, oh my God, what do I do? It's just, there's no work. So, so you, you go, you, I love this story. You come, you come to the UK, you know, no one. Yeah. Right. You work on a bunch of student projects, some indie projects. You're just trying so hard to meet people. Yeah. Then you get Christmas in paradise. Then you get the, your Turkish film. And then when you start to get some momentum and you're starting to feel like you belong, you get hit with basically a year of no work and an actor strike. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I mean, for me, that was definitely really, really tough on just the whole mindset. Cause you're like, I've put so much hard work, sweat and tears into getting to where I am. That sort of not being able to build on that momentum just feels like, you know, a stab in the back kind of thing. Well, don't, don't forget too, like the risk. Yeah. that you take by being a, a freelance creative yeah. professional is huge. And I don't think enough people really understand. Like you can go months without work just because you're waiting for the phone call and you, you all you can do in, in the meantime, and is what I spent the last 12 months doing is networking. You just sort of meet as many people as you can so that hopefully when things pick up again, which we're still at a stage where things are only just, starting to pick up, but it's still not there yet. Um, you know, you hope that by meeting all these people, they'll go, oh, well, you know, now I've got this project, let me call you on. But then there's, I'm I'm one of millions who have been trying to network for the last 12 months. So it, it, it really does throw a whole spanner in the works. I've, I've, I've had a lot of people in here in the creative space yeah. um, on the podcast and things like that. And the number one thing that's coming across is like people are just holding their breath crossing their fingers and being like holy fuck i hope i can just get back to work and like things can be normal in 2024 because the last four years have just been a roller coaster and and i always i i say this like i said this a lot covid and then the strike has completely decimated freelance creatives so if you're still a dop if you're still a director if you're still an actor after what we've just been through for the last four years, you are incredibly motivated, incredibly talented, and also a little bit lucky. Oh yeah. 
it's it's not so, probably suicidal is a bit uh extreme but it is it is a huge huge sacrifice to take and you know you just really hope that with all the people that have left the industry with things picking up that you will maybe get a shot this time and or be able to jump back into into the flow of things but you know obviously like when co after covid you know the world took months to find its momentum again uh, and we still are trying to sort of figure out how to move from on from covid and I think the strikes is very much like COVID in the sense where, yes, the strikes came to an end in December, but we're in March and there's still no work because it's going to take six months for things to find normality again and find momentum in the film industry. I think that's a great point. Not a lot of people probably watching don't really understand. Like These projects are 18 and 24 month kind of uh, time horizons, right? Yeah. So no one's going to invest in an 18 month or a 24 month return on investment unless they fucking know that they can get people together to actually make the film and then they can get people into a cinema to pay for tickets to watch it. Yeah. And if you don't have that confidence from starting point to end point, there's no money that moves. And if there's no money moving, there's nothing to film. No, absolutely. And I think it's, in, it's going to be a very, very interesting period for cinema. Um, I think the fact is with how much money has been lost, how much projects have gone under because of the strikes and the, the realization that it's so much easier to do, you know, smaller budget projects. Um, I think indie cinema is going to take a, a huge leapfrog forward. And I think, you know, the, I, I forget his name, who won Best Adapted Screenplay at uh, for American Fiction on uh, at the Oscars. Jeffrey or oh, Jeffrey Wright Jeffrey Wright whose speech was to the studios he said please instead of making one 200 million dollar film make 10 20 million dollar films do 20 10 million dollar films and I think that might be something we might be seeing more of and I hope I really hope that's the case because I think that will help bring momentum again it'll bring it'll create jobs for those who have been waiting so long for for work and, you know, you, there are very small projects at the minute that are making huge money back. And so the, the risk is a lot lower doing a $10 million film and being able to make 40, 50 mil in, at the box office, which is not huge compared to like what some of the big blockbuster films make at the box office. But it's still a very nice return on investment. Um, and if you do 20 of them, the re returns even more uh you know entertaining you're gonna love this i had a i had a meeting with a production uh executive a while back so we were talking about making some adventure tv for them right mm -hmm. and and it's exactly what you're saying so like 10 years ago if um if someone at discovery channel or nat geo or whatever got a production budget of 15 million dollars for a year yeah they would give a million dollars to 15 producers or 15 directors and, and and 15 voices, 15 creators, and then they would get 15 television shows or, or, or documentary films back, and then they would put those out into the world, and if two or three of them hit, and you did okay, and you know, you got good ratings, and that was like considered a good, a good bit, of, a good yeah. season, right? And I thrived on that because I was one of the 15. And now, fast forward, you know, past COVID, you know, now people are putting that entire $15 million budget into one project yeah. and then hiring like Robert Downey Jr. or Chris Hemsworth or whatever to do, you know, television because they need these stars to like break through all the noise that's out there in the hope that, you know, they'll, they'll get some traction or their streaming service will get some more subscribers. And I'm totally on board with what you're saying because we need to be putting more people back to work. And we need to have more voices coming through. It can't all just be like the same 10 actors doing Marvel movies and also all of our television. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, a great example of that whole theory of the, the small indie budgets taking a huge leap forward is, is A24. Yeah, for sure. They've been legendary. They, they're huge. I think the fact that they're able to produce some of the most popular films at the minute with actors who are only just coming through you know some who are first-time actors or stuff like that so they really their goal is they're not going for 
the big blockbuster actors, A-list sort of Oscar winning, uh, but they and they're not putting a hundred million dollar on a film. They're they're doing a bunch of ten million dollar uh, ten million dollar films. And I mean, look, Saltburn. I think Holdovers was. I love the Holdovers. I love the Holdovers. And you know, obviously, A twenty four has a style. You know, they they only do certain kinds of films, and they do it in a very unique way that you can tell that it's an A twenty four film. Uh, but right now, that concept has proven to work better than any production company out there, and so I think that's a statement, if anything, as to how this whole smaller budget but multiple project. Uh, ba- uh, you know, business model is is working. It works. The other thing too that's very interesting, um, and um, if you Google it on YouTube, or if you check on YouTube, you'll see this interview um, with Matt Damon. Yeah. And Matt Damon was talking about Goodwill Hunting, right? Um, where the him and Ben Affleck won an Oscar for writing, and Robin Williams, the late Robin Williams, won an Oscar for best supporting actor. So uh, he's and, he, and Gus Van Sant directed it, he, and he was just like, you know, we could never make a movie like Goodwill Hunting today. Yeah. Because back in the day, he said, like, you could make a movie and not get all your money back at the box office because you had a DVD release coming, like, three or six months later. Yeah. And he was like, that was, like, another release of the movie. Like, that was another marketing round. And then, you know, you could definitely make your money back on the DVD release. And he goes, now, you know, you do um, you do the initial release in the theaters and there's no DVD release. It just goes straight to streaming and the streamers don't pay anything. So he goes, you're missing that second window. And and you, it just doesn't make sense anymore. Like he goes, you have to you have to spend you have to spend exactly what you make on the movie to market it. So if you make a twenty five million dollar movie, you have to spend twenty five million dollars to market it. So now the budget for the movie is fifty million. And if you and if you do a fifty million dollar movie, then okay, the th- the theaters take fifty percent. So now you have to make a hundred percent in ticket sales or a hundred million in ticket sales. Give fifty to the movie theaters, AMC or whatever. And then fifty to the filmmakers, and then that's just bre- that's just breaking even. Yeah. And he goes, it's just, and he goes, it's so hard to have enough of a reach, um, stylistically and storytelling wise, to do a hundred million dollar movie because not everyone wants to watch Goodwill Hunting, you know, or or the holdovers. Yeah. You know, they're kind of niche, they're kind of art house, they're kind of different. You know, they'll do well and they'll win at awards, but they might not make a hundred million dollars at the box office. So he goes, th- that it's taken out this entire, like, um genre of these like like you said a24 style movies like these yeah. these kind of art house lower budget movies well obviously i think what's also changed since goodwill hunting is the 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 world of streaming has has made the whole process uh easier for indie cinema uh where they can make a, a short budget film and then a feature film and then sort of sell it to netflix and this and that and make some return on it with a global outreach um i mean that's you know what we're trying to do we're doing with the turkish film where it went through we put it through festival circuit but it's meant to i think netflix are buying it to you know have it on turkish netflix and uh and yeah that's for a movie that did we i think at the budget on that was about five hundred thousand euros uh, which is very very small budget. <laughs> it's huge, but probably pr- uh, a decent size for Turkey. Probably. Uh, from, well, you know, the Turks are, are making some really big budget stuff. Uh, a lot of like the sort of Persian Empire uh, TV series and stuff like that. So, but it's just for a movie that does have a budget of five hundred thousand. If you can then sell your your movie to Netflix for even two three million euros, that's a that's a great sort of without having to sell, you know, having to pay back the, the, the cinemas and, and the theaters and all that stuff. So, I mean, I'm I'm not a producer, so I, I probably don't know the exact finance that go behind sort of distribution. Mm. But uh, I, I reckon that and is why streaming is so popular nowadays with indie cinema is that it's it's a sort of you cut the middleman out, you know. I think you do cut the middleman out, but I also think they know that. Yeah. And I think they definitely drive the costs as probably. Yeah. 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 They they definitely have a corner. They definitely have a stranglehold on. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't. Because you think about it, like you can't. Like I mean, Netflix is amazing because you can, or, or like Netflix or 
actually Netflix is probably the most global of them all. Like you can you can make something and then all of a sudden have a global reach. It's it's very it's very it's quite spectacular. And that's why you know they've gotten so powerful. I mean, most of the projects you see, the big projects are Apple, Netflix, Amazon, and uh, and I think it, it's going to be interesting to see how studios adapt to that in in the next sort of 10 15 years you know i think this the whole studio world and that monopoly of cinema that studios used to have is is probably sort of struggling with the whole sort of dealing with indie cinemas and streaming platforms you know well during the strike during the strike a lot of people were actually saying um that the streamers should actually have their own contracts with people like SAG yeah because the streamers don't pay royalties and stuff like that right so you when you when you make something for Netflix you know they pay for it once they own it for life right and you don't get any kickback on that in the future whereas if you make something for Warner Brothers and it goes out to the theaters you know once the money and the spending and the marketing has been recouped then every dollar that comes back gets divided up you know for the actors directors and the studio so so you get like a lifelong income for making one great piece of art. It might, it, you know, five years later, it might be pennies a month or a year, but at least it's still there, right? So it's a, t it's a totally different um, financing game. And I think, yeah. I think that the actors, you know, especially when you talk about, when you talk about not working for months in between projects, like it's, it's royalties that get you through. Oh, big time. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because obviously you've got stuff like in France, you have a, a great sort of support system for, the uh, the arts where they've got something called l'intermittence du spectacle uh, and they have that in general like l'intermittence which is if you do a certain amount of work uh, hours of work in a year then the government will uh, pay you minimum wage for all the days you don't work oh that's interesting it's really really quite fascinating obviously it comes with its flaws where you have to choose between what's called a city which is a contract with a company or being intermittent, which is like saying you're unemployed, you know, signing that you're unemployed, officially unemployed. Like like freelancing now. Yeah, uh, but you're, you're making it very official in France. And obviously you can't be, you can't have both. You can't have the city and uh, l'intermittence. Uh, but for freelancers, especially in it, whether it be like theater actors, uh, you know, filmmakers like directors, DPs and all that who don't have, who, who are not linked to a, a, a steady stream of income. Uh, they, you know, having that sort of support system where every day you, you, you have off, uh, if you, if you're doing like a month off uh, because of the lack of work, um, obviously you, a bit like tax returns, you have to prove that you've done X amount of work and that yeah uh, of hours and you have to prove that you're unable to you to get any work during this period uh, or that there is no one getting in touch with you then the government will will pay you but obviously it's a lot of sort of bureaucracy uh but still a lot better than what the uk does mm -hmm. you know it was i think this is the one thing i hate about the uk is you know, during COVID, the UK film industry was one of the only sectors that was allowed to work. And why, and why was that? Because it was, there was so much money going into the film industry from, from America that this money, the, the English were in need of that for the economy. You know, there was so much uh, money that the government were trying to build up to be able to pay for things during COVID that they needed, um, they they needed that money coming from from the U.S. So they allowed filmmakers to shoot under certain regulations, obviously. But we were the only industry in the U.K. that was allowed to work outside of home, and um, and we, as the film industry, were the the uh, the economy in in the U.K. You know, we were bringing income to the U.K. economy. And so you'd expect for something so important to be protected by the UK government, especially during something like strikes, which we don't have uh, control over. Um, but no, if anything, we have our prime minister, Rishi Sunak, going and saying publicly that we should go and learn to get a real job. Oh, wow. I didn't hear that. Oh, yeah. He, I mean, it's it's somewhere near those words like, 
let them go and learn to, to a, a proper trade or something like that. And kind of kind of sounds typical from like a Goldman Sachs banker. Oh yeah, exactly. You know, and so that was shocking for us. You know, that they're in in a situation where seventy five percent of the film industry is out of work, and yet the government don't really care. They don't bat an eye. And they don't create anything to support those filmmakers who have families and don't can't work when there is no work. That's a very strange uh, set of reactions from the UK government during COVID where they let you guys stay open and do the thing. And then during the strike where they just turn their backs. Makes no sense at all. And Like uh, most politics. Exactly. And you know what's even funnier? And uh, it, it just fired back so brutally, which was amazing to watch. Rishi Sunak back in, I think, January posted a video on his Instagram of him getting hands on at Pinewood Studios going into like the the production design department and you know hammering a nail into a, a set or something uh, like a, a you know set design and getting in hands on with all these departments at Pinewood Studio and saying like we are proud of our studios and the comment section was so fired back at him so badly. I think he had to take the post down because they were like, how can you, how dare you? Mm. How dare you show up and post something like this when only a few months ago you were telling us to go and learn to get a real job? Yeah, you can't go from like directing feature films to then like, yeah, what, being an accountant or a lawyer? Yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, No, absolutely. So it was just sort of that, that's what's, the problem in the UK. I think that's our biggest problem is as soon as the government sort of acknowledge how important we are as an industry and how, it, it, like we said earlier, you know, freelance is a sacrifice mm-hmm. as a filmmaker. And, you know, that's nothing that we have control over. You know, it's just how the industry is built. You either work for a company as a producer or an editor for, at an at a, a editing house or you're a director, actor, or DP, which is freelance and can't go and you, you can't be a director and uh, and hire, be hired at a production company. It doesn't work like that. You, If you're at a production company, it's a nine to five job. As a director, it's sort of, you have to create your own work. And that the government don't help people like that is is really, it's like shooting yourself in the foot. Completely. I have friends here in LA who are in their kind of like late twenties. They went to NYU. They worked for me in the past as freelancers and things like that. And I remember them saying, you know, like all they want is a job that's like COVID proof and strike proof. Yeah. Because the last four years have kind of destroyed them, like mentally, financially, like they're just exhausted by the whole experience. And and now all they want to do is just find a job where they don't have to worry about this shit anymore because that's, it's been too too stressful for them. Yeah, that's thousands of that one third of the 75 percent that were unemployed. That's what they did. It was just like, you know, I love the film industry and I wish I could stay in it. But when you do have the reality of a kid and family and you have to feed mouths, you know, you you have to start considering where where can I get money? And the problem is. A lot of these people are so far into their film career that ha- having to step away is, is huge because they're having to start from scratch. Yeah, because they have in no... In the 30s, mm-hmm. the 40s, you know, it's just like... I mean, I, I feel fortunate to be in my in my 20s where I, I can still, like, hopefully, you know, by the time I reach 30, things will, will be back up and running and I... And I can still be in the film industry, but it's scary. It is scary to think that this could happen again any time, and that there is no net to to help me in in situations where I would have to go a year without work. It's crazy, isn't it? But you know, I'm. I always take things day by day. I take, you know, I I think about tomorrow, and not ten years. And for now, I'm just you know waiting. So things sort of pick up. I've got a few smaller projects when I get back. But let's talk about why you're in LA. I mean, you just flew in from London. I know, um, and, you, and you're here to hang out with me for a bit. <laughs> but but why are you really in town? Well, firstly, I think due to the quiet period, it was just sort of like, oh my god, you know, I haven't been to America in ten years. I've got lots of friends there. I've got, uh, a- a- and just in general, America has lots going on. So let's use this quiet period to to go and show up, show your face. Do a bit of networking, reconnect with film buddies. You know, I 
just yesterday I saw two two friends of mine, one from the Warner Bros program and one from my middle school, the American school in Paris, who I haven't seen in over 10 years, you know, or, or 10 years uh, on the dot, you know, and it's just great to sort of be like 10 years on, oh my God, you're a DP, I'm a DP, oh my God, you're a director, I'm I'm a DP, like we, we've come this far and so it was it was just good to rekindle those those uh, connections. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I'm I'm here. Just a bit of showing my face, network with some more people, which is like I said, all I've been able to do for the last twelve months. And uh, you just never know what meetings will will bring in the future. Well, I hope you you know I hope you have a meeting later today, and someone wanted to ask you to start working uh, next week on a. Six month shoot, right? Uh, we we hope so. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, uh, a lot of people that I've met so far, they're they're busy. I mean, obviously, as a European working in America is is nigh on impossible uh, with a th without the visa process. Um, but you know, at least you know you show your face and you go well. You know, if you guys are shooting uh, for all those in America, if you, it's like if you're shooting something in London or in Europe, and or you need something shot in Europe. I'm your man. Also, too, you, it's pretty easy to get a visa here for the film and television industry. I can tell you on, on, I can tell you now, or I can tell you offline. It's up to you. But you can get what's called an O1 visa, which is a special talent visa. And as long as you have like a trailer or like a teaser of your work, mm. and you're you're on IMDb, you can get you can get a visa to work here if you want. Yeah. So if so, and then and then actually you can get that, and then you can pick it up in London. You can get it at the U.S. Embassy in London. Um, and then you can always have it. And then, you know, when you tell directors or other creatives that you you have an O-1 visa, it lasts for three years and you can work in the United States at any time. So you're on call, you're ready to go, right? So that's kind of, the, I've gone through this process because I'm from Canada. So yep. um, so I've gone through this process in order to stay here in the United States and, and get some work because I've, you know, it was pretty easy. I, I've done mm -hmm. lots of shit. So um, it was easy to kind of get, but, um, but it is available and I can walk you through it after if you want. Yeah. Well, yeah, work yeah. is work, right? We got to keep working. Absolutely, no. Well, that's that's exactly the point. You know, I mean, for example, I had a meeting with uh, Shane Herbert the other day, uh, who's ASC, did Act of Valor, uh, Need for Speed, Terminator Salvation, and uh, and we had a a whole. You know, I helped him out shooting something, and then he uh, he had we went out for dinner and had a, a long chat. And he's like, oh, you know, I'm just about to start shooting this uh, SEAL, like, SEAL Team 6 uh, project with Chris Pratt. And I'm just like, I mean, if you need so. And I'm like, I'll stay longer if I need to. But, you know, I'd love to to, to help out that. Obviously, he, he's got his whole cruise and all that. But, for, you know, I'd love to be able to offer my services wherever. And it's part of the whole travel, you know, travel for work, you know. Yeah. It, no, it's crucial. And I mean, honestly, it's like um, a month to put together the paperwork, and then four to six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, we'll we'll see. Anyways, back to London and just sort of see how things pick up there. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, like at this stage in the year, you just don't know how busy you're going to be yet. Like you could just that that uncertainty drives people insane sometimes. Yeah. I I know it's I've had many years of that sort of uncertainty you know between you know even when i moved to the uk as a focus puller there were times like where i met went a whole month without work because it was just like you know you can pitch yourself x amount of times but it doesn't mean you're always going to get the job um and so you know that sort of uncertainty of like oh my god one month without work is huge especially because that's rent that's uh, food that's just sort of like you're you're living is you're having to put your life on hold for a whole month and you know if it goes several months it's even worse you know and you're living in london the most expensive city in the world yes <laughs> then again paris is also very expensive um yeah that's true i think even more so than london to be fair <laughs> we'll have to check we'll have to check on that yeah so uh so is there anything else you want to chat about or promote or what to what you I, know listen again uh i'm i'm just glad to be in the u.s i'm i'm here to show my face and sort of talk uh, talk about me uh, what i've been up to and i think uh if anything for for young filmmakers i think it's it's obviously a tough period of time 
um, you know, I'm, I had a meeting last night with a, my friend from from the American school who's currently doing his thesis at USC. And um, he sort of said to me, he's like, how, how do I get started? How do I, uh, especially as a director, uh, what, what do I do? You know, where, do, whoa, what are the steps to become a director when you're done with school? Start cleaning the toilets. Exactly. That's exactly, I, I mean, I pretty much said to him, I said, you're just going to have to sort of throw yourself out there, do anything and everything, you know, try and get yourself on to, as like a first AD and try and r just continue writing stuff, go to all the events. You know, I'm uh, in London, I'm part of the BSC club, so a house, the BFI, uh, and I always look at if there are any extra film events on and, you know, you just have to network because network is all it is. And, you know, even today I, I'm... Yeah, I'm at a point where I I'm probably not looking to fully like step back to ACing, but I'm I'm very happy. I'm mostly looking to get on jobs like a B unit DOP or a C unit TP, just trying to get involved in, in in projects in any way, shape, or form to learn. Again, going back to the whole sort of l learning on the uh, like coming into jobs with an open mind, and uh, and so yeah. Well, just uh, hopefully when things pick up, the phone rings, you know? Well, there's so much, I mean, like I know for a fact there's so many new television shows being cast right now. So there, there's like another Game of Thrones spinoff. There's, a, yeah, there's like a John Wick spinoff. There's a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff. So, I mean, and these, these are, um, some of these are episodic television shows, right? So, I mean, it'd be amazing to get a DOP, you know, and get a chance to work on like eight episodes or something like that. Listen, at this point, I'll take anything, you know, I'm just... Uh, I just want to shoot. Can you climb mountains and carry shit? And let's do it. Yeah, that's the. I mean, I'm happy to do documentary. I've done documentary, and I love. Uh, you know, again, like I said, a lot of my cinematography is documentary influenced. Um, so I, I'm my gaffer right now, is Louis Gambardella. Shout out to him. Nice. One. Uh, is uh, it was just called on to to be a B camera op for this Dutch DP. Uh, get the name but nsc dp um and they're shooting a dock in uh, outside kinshasa in the congo like 10 hour drive away uh and in this village remote village and you know he him it's just him the dp and the director uh and then the obviously the uh the guys helping out on on the ground um that sounds terrifying but no, I mean, it sounds terrifying. It sounds great, exciting. You, you know, he's telling me all about w what it's like, and obviously, it's it, it's rough conditions. But I think that's the excitement of it. It's just the adventures. You know? The adventures are amazing. I, I got one for you. Uh, I was in southern Uganda a couple of years ago filming, and uh, and there's this mountain you can climb in southern Uganda, and it basically sits on three international borders. So it sits on Uganda, and then to the south is Rwanda, and then to the west is Congo. And and so you can stand on the top of this mountain and look right into the Congo. And at this this was the time of, like, Ebola. This was the time of, like, tourists being kidnapped and, mm. like, all kinds of crazy shit was going on in the Congo. And and for people who don't know, like, this whole area is volcanic. So, so southern Uganda, um, southeastern Congo northern Rwanda um, there's a lot of volcanic lakes and there's still some active volcanoes and I remember we got up to the top and we just looked out and there was just like there were actually active volcanoes like where you could see the really? yeah oh wow I was just like holy shit this place is like on fire it just looked like Mordor like it just, just felt that must sound so cool I mean I was just like visualizing it yeah I mean shooting that sort of stuff must be fascinating yeah it was cool but I just remember like looking into the Congo and feeling like that's Mordor like that's yeah. That's terrifying. What's going on over there? I don't want to go. Yeah. yeah. Plus, with the war there, I mean, God, yeah, it. You got to tread carefully. That's sort of like the whole process that Louis was telling me about, sort of his, you know, prepping for this trip. You know, he was telling me, oh my God, we're we're having to check with timings and getting the right uh, guys on to like make sure we're safe and all that and I'm like wow to shoot a project that you have to go through those sort of steps is is quite mental yeah it definitely uh, yeah. definitely changes things it's on the fly though like everything yeah. is on the fly you just when when shit happens you just start rolling yeah, yeah. big time beautiful
All right, buddy. Well, look, it's good to catch up. Thanks. So, look, we go to the wide, shake it out. Thank you very much, sir. Fantastic to meet you. And same here. Come Thank back you. anytime. I'd love to. Brilliant. Cheers. Fade to black. <laughs>